Hello, I'm Molly Hughes in the Denver Post newsroom with today's Behind the Headlines. We're talking about a story that Denver Post reporter Noelle Phillips has been working on for Sunday's paper. It is an in-depth look at the Denver Sheriff's Department one year after independent consultants completed a 300-page report on what was wrong with the jail and what needed to happen to reform the department. The jail has been riddled with problems after the deaths of several inmates, excessive force cases, organizational chaos, and mismanagement. Sheriff Patrick Furman was hired about six months ago as part of the effort to reform Denver's two jails and the department. He joins me now. Welcome. Thank you. How would you say it's going now, six months in, let's say on a scale of one to ten? I think it's going very well. Um, you know, we've got uh, a lot of support, uh, really a lot of good people within the department. What do you think it was about you, as they did this nationwide search over several months, that made you the right person to unravel the problems at this department? You know, I, I don't know who else they were looking at. Um, I, I know, I, I think one of the reasons why I think that, uh, that I was a popular pick was that I, I have experience in corrections. Um, I spent my entire life working in jails within the Sheriff's Department. Um, I understand what it takes to run a jail. I understand. Um, the culture of the, uh, the, of the deputies, um, and, I, and I think that I'm a good fit for the department. It's been one year since the reforms were ordered, 300 pages, a lot to digest, yes. a lot of challenges, a lot of changes that need to be made. What has changed to this point? Um, one of the things that we focused on was um, this idea of an inmate management division, which is fairly new, a new concept, I think, within, uh, within jails. Um, and that's focusing on people. You know, typically a department is, is built or uh, structured based on the buildings. Uh, we wanted to look at the, the structure as in terms of people and, and functions. And so we have a whole division that is just dedicated to inmate management, which would include things like uh, classification, uh, inmate grievances, um, where we house inmates within the facility. So anything that deals with, with inmates programming um, would fall into this uh, particular major who's heading up this division. By all accounts, you have been described as a man who is uh, very kind and uh, a nice person and who wants to make sure that the inmates are treated with respect and dignity. How do you see that being part of the solution? So our strategic focus is, is broken down into those three areas. It's, it's our staff, it's the inmates, and it's the community, uh, all focused on this idea of relationships. Uh, building relationships, not seeing inmates as, as inmates, but seeing them as individual people, uh, seeing the deputies as individual people. You know, we don't want, um, a lot of times there's, there's not a face on the Denver Sheriff's Department, and so um, out in the community it's, it's just the Denver Sheriff's Department, and, and we want people to see um, the work, the good work that our deputies are doing. We have some very, very dedicated, um, passionate people working for us that, that really want to do good, good work, um, and we want to highlight that. Uh, we want to celebrate that with them, and, and we want that to, to, to trickle down into the way that we treat our inmate population. But one of the issues is that uh, because of a shortage of deputies, uh, there was excessive overtime, running up you know millions of dollars in overtime pay, mm -hmm. and frankly leading to a deputy staff that was run down, worn out, tired, exhausted, and not really creating the best environment to be patient with a difficult population like right. inmates. Right. So how has that, have you noticed a shift? We're starting to notice that. You know, we had a, we had a group of uh, 23 deputies graduate in February. Um, we just last Friday had our mega class graduate of 80 deputies. Mm -hmm. um, they're doing their community service work this week and they'll go through the FTO program for the, for the following four weeks. Um, I think that's a huge piece. You know, we talk about some of these foundational uh, activities that we're doing, uh, getting the staff on board to, to provide the the breaks uh, to provide the time off and to not have our staff working the long overtime hours. Um, you know, they need to be at the top of their game if, we're, if they're going to make good decisions. And so I think bringing the staff on board um, and again seeing it with, uh, with the 80 deputies that just graduated last week, I think those are some of the key foundational things that's really going to head this department in the right direction. And what is FTO training? FTO is a field training officer. So once they go through the academy training, we, we hook them up with a, with a deputy, a seasoned deputy that's been trained to train other deputies. And so it's kind of an on-the-job uh, type of a situation where they uh, shadow the, the deputy, um, learn about the specifics of actually working on the job. So each deputy, as I understand it, the ones who have been on the job for years will go through retraining 
right? A 40-hour yes. yes. course of yes. retraining. What will be entailed in that, and how will that make the positive changes that are necessary? Well, the, the training that you're, you're talking about is the CIT, which is the, the Crisis Intervention Training, and it's a nationally recognized program. It's a 40-hour course. It's a very... Um, they spend time doing scenarios. Uh, we have act actors that come in and, and act like uh, inmates with mental health issues or inmates that are in crisis. Um, and so they go through a scenario-based training. We, we take them out and we visit various uh, community centers that deal with the mentally ill. Um, so there's an opportunity for the staff to see um, the mentally ill in a, in a different environment and for the mentally ill to see our staff in a different environment. Um, but really, it's about de-escalation, which is what we're talking about. You know, we, we're raising the bar on what we're expecting our staff to do in terms of the decisions they make. Um, and in order to do that effectively, we get to provide them the resources and the training. Um, this de-escalation training is one of those tools that we th feel is, is critical to their success. So we've, we're committed to training all of our staff uh, within 2016 in this CIT training, and we're, we're well on the way to doing that. And one of the biggies of the uh, recommendations um, of reform was that the use of force policy change. Yes. Um, in part learning better skills like de-escalation, but that has been through 10 renditions in the last year and still there is no new policy in place yet unless right. it's happened in the last 24 hours. Why is that? Um, you know, there's a, a lot of people involved with this. We, we thought it was important to get not only our staff, but, but the public, the community involved with this. They needed to be a part of this. Um, you know, anytime you get a, a group together that big, um, it, it's, it's tough to get consensus on that. Um, this is a big deal. Um, this, is, this is one of the main things within the reform efforts, and so we want to make sure that we get it right. Um, we're very close to having that final policy put in place. Um, in the meantime, we've, we've, asked, we've uh, emphasized in our training academies the, the idea of de-escalation. We've talked with our staff about de-escalation. Um, so it's not a matter of waiting for this new policy to come out before we all of a sudden change everything. We're in the process of changing all of that now. Um, the, the new use of force policy will help clarify some of those expectations for our staff. Um, and it's, it's coming soon. We're, we're, we're very close to having the final product. And boy, did you get put through the test. Within your first month on the job, we had uh, the death of inmate Michael Marshall. Yes. Um, and that video was released and very disturbing to a lot of people, frankly, anybody who saw it. Mm -hmm. um, you pre pledged transparency through that investigation. Michael Marshall ended up dying as a result of injuries uh, right. that he incurred during that episode. How have you handled that situation? Because there are critics who say it actually, you, there hasn't been transparency. Uh, you know, and I think, and I, I wasn't here to compare it with anything else. Um, I, I think we work really hard to make sure that we communicated with the family. Um, I think we did a pretty good job of getting the video out to the family on a, in a timely manner. I, I, I understand it was much quicker than in any previous incidents. Um, we've been in the process now of, of uh, communicating with the family on a regular basis to give them updates. Um, it's a horrible incident. I mean, this, it's, it's tragic when anybody dies within your custody. Um, but I think we're, we're working really hard to, to be different than we have in the past. Is there any any pushback or have you noticed a shift because let's face it if you are working every single day with criminals or people who have broken the law and and you're a deputy who's stressed and tired and frustrated um, it, it seems like it would be hard to change that culture that if they've been in this job for mm -hmm. years how do you change that mindset it, it's tough um, this is a very I mean this is a very difficult culture to, to change yeah um, you know we talk about relationships um, I, I think one of the challenges that we're going to have is, is traditionally in, in our field, you know, we don't trust people. Um, we have to assume the worst about somebody until we know differently because otherwise it puts our staff in danger. And so when we start to talk with them about developing relationships and looking at, at people as individuals as opposed to a group, um, there's a challenge there because that's not the way that they were brought up. Um, so that's, that's what we've been focusing on is trying to get that turned around. Um, you know, there's a, there's a balance to that as well. We still need to maintain professional uh, lines uh, with, with the MA population. Um, so there's a, there's a big balance there that we need to maintain. I think part of, um, part of changing the culture is, you know, we just brought in 80 new deputies. Um, we have 800 uniform staff. 80 deputies is 10% of our workforce. That's, that's huge when you're talking about, you know, changing a culture. And so as we look at recruiting, as we look at the, the new people that we're bringing in, we're really focusing on leadership skills. Um, every one of our deputies are in a leadership position. Um, you know, they're, they're supervising inmates in a housing unit, um, sometimes 60, 65 inmates at a time. Um, that's all leadership skills that's important. And so we, we're really changing our focus even in terms of who we're bringing into the department. 
So in my research, I understand you are a very religious man. Uh, how has your faith helped you? Um, you know, I, we always talk about with, with our staff, and, and I know the mayor has talked about uh, having this why, understanding why. Um, Simon Sinet uh, talks about that with um, understanding your why and, and how that's important. And I, and I think um, being a man of faith, being a, a Christian, uh, for me, that's my ultimate why. Um, it provides me a, a foundation for what I'm doing and, and uh, gives me a reason for doing it. And I know you've been here a little more than six months now. Your family is still back in Illinois. Yes. Um, that has afforded you great opportunity to work crazy long hours, even yes. getting up in the middle of the night. Yes. Um, what do you do to blow off steam? You know, I, I like to work out. I, I do CrossFit. Um, I, I spend a lot of time FaceTiming my family. Um, we, still, we still maintain that connection. Um, I count on my wife to, to keep my head out of the weeds. Um, so we, we spend a lot of time on the phone and on FaceTime. All right. Denver Sheriff Patrick Furman, thanks for being here with thanks. us today. And you can learn more about the personal side of the man who has now been charged with reforming the Denver Sheriff's Department. You can also learn more about the progress that has been made and challenges that still lie ahead by reading our special report by Noel Phillips in Sunday's paper. For now, I'm Molly Hughes in the Denver Post Newsroom with today's Behind the Headlines.